Well, good morning, Crossing Church. How are you doing today? I really, I mean, is it like, are you surviving? Like all the crazy, nutty stuff that is going on. I'll tell you what, you go to the grocery store, you, it, uh, yeah, it's survival, isn't it? It's just nuts. And it's just going to get nuttier and nuttier until next weekend hits. And uh, I hope that you're surviving, and this is like a moment of sanity and a moment of clarity and what is the rest of your holiday season. I want to welcome all of our locations joining from all over this region. So thankful for each and every one of you, and if you're inside or online, we're thankful for you as well. And how many of you are not done shopping yet? Raise your hand. Just be honest. How many of you are all done? Well, you're you're a little better than first service. You're actually you're actually doing a little bit better. Well, if you haven't gotten everything that you need to get, I'll give you a couple of great ideas. One is I don't know a better gift that you could give your spouse than inviting them to come with you to a marriage retreat. We've had uh, four of those. We've had about 120 people go through them. It's been a great experience for them. And uh, we have three scheduled for the spring, and you can get on that QR code and go down through the tree and see uh, when those are. I think there's one at the end of February, a couple in March, and that would be a great gift to give each other because there's nothing better to invest in than your marriage. So I want you to consider that coming up uh, in the spring and uh, in the uh, winter of 2023, actually begins the day after Christmas. Uh, the crossing is taking a group to the Holy Land. Now that's a little bit, that's an expensive uh, gift that you could give. And they're about, we're about half filled up already. So uh, if you're uh, considering that, you can get more information. You can do the same thing on the QR code and uh, see what's up with that. Because that is a singular experience, so it's a life-changing experience. And I uh, hope every one of you gets to do that sometime in your life. Well, uh, we're in the series called The Gift I Need, and uh, last time uh, to tackle this before all of the, what, over 40 Christmas uh, Eve type services that we're having all across the region, and we've been looking particularly at a scripture in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 9, which is a, a prophetic scripture about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus. And uh, we're kind of going through these different descriptions uh, that he uses, these different metaphors that he uses to describe the coming Messiah. And the one that I was assigned was Everlasting Father. So I've been thinking about that in the last few weeks as I've been preparing to speak with you about the idea of an everlasting Father. And, uh, and so it it, it uh, you know, when I think about my father, I get nostalgic, and uh, I might, you, you, may, you may as well, depending upon, I mean, it, it evokes different kinds of emotions, depending upon your upbringing, your experience. For me, it was a reflection back to October 21st, 1999. Now, October 21st is my birthday. So you can write that down in case you have someone that you need to, you know, just so be ready for next year. But uh, October 21st, I was born in 59, so it was my 40th birthday. And it's that birthday. You know, your 40th birthday is kind of that birthday. It's that birthday when you go, I have just crested the hill. And now I'm going to be going down the other side. You know, and people that are all younger than me are going to be considering me old, right? Like I'm over the hill. Maybe, maybe you might even get so, uh, uh, I don't know, introspective that you might contemplate your own mortality. That particular day, October 21st, 1999, I was contemplating mortality. Just not my own. Because that was the day that I buried my father. What a 40th birthday to be able to, to lay my father to, to rest. It, was, it made it a very, very difficult day. And I remember going, I mean, I was officiating. So uh, I had the privilege of officiating my father's funeral and my mother's funeral, my brother's funeral. 
And so I'm officiating, and so I'm wearing two hats, right? I'm wearing the, I'm the morning sun hat, and I'm missing my father. And then I'm also that person who's responsible that everything runs smoothly in this service, and I wanted to make sure that he was properly honored. And I remember after going through the service and, you know, into the, uh, the dad's body, into the hearse, and then taking the hearse to the other side of uh, Indianapolis, uh, to Washington Park Cemetery, where my mother had been buried five years before. And my, my family, not me, if they would have listened to me, they would have made a different choice, but my family picked out the casket, and they picked out an oak casket. Now, those of you that know anything about wood know something about oak. What is it? It's heavy. It's heavy. And for some reason, uh, we chose six pallbearers instead of eight. And you really needed to have eight uh, pallbearers for this. And so uh, my job, uh, my responsibility uh, when the hearse arrives at the uh, cemetery is I go to the back of the, of the hearse. I stand there. The pallbearers line up backwards they, and they, you know, they uh, bring out the casket. And then I walk in front of the casket to the burial site, about maybe 10 feet in front, and they follow me to the, to the burial site. So that's what I'm doing, and uh, uh, going forward, and you know, there, there's, there's just some circumstances I have to be aware of. Well, I happened to look back. Now, my brother at the time was toward the front of the casket as one of the pallbearers, and as I looked behind me, I could see something happening that my brother's knees were buckling because it was heavy. And he was going to lose it. And I mean, I'm thinking to myself, this will be horrible if that were to happen. And I figured out that day why they put handles on the ends of the casket. Because all I needed to do was step back and put my hand down on that, onto that handle and lift up that handle. And I looked at my brother, he looked at me, and it was like, thank you. Thank you so much. And I carried, I helped carry my father's body that, the rest of the way uh, to uh, where he was set on that part that lowers the casket down. And when I was doing that, there was something that occurred to me. That all these years, those 40 years, my dad had carried the burden for me. From the day I was born, he carried the burden for me. And here now I have the opportunity, just for a moment, to return the favor and carry the burden with him. And I have to tell you that, you know, I was blessed. I was really blessed as a son to have a father like I had because. He bore uh, the burden of his family and the burden that I presented him with with so much grace. I never heard, I can't tell you, I'm, I'm not lying. I don't think I ever heard my dad really raise his voice in anger. I can't remember him ever swearing. Not one off-color word out of his mouth. I can't say either one of those things. But I can say those about him. And that's pretty amazing. I'm not saying that he didn't have his faults, but I just didn't, he didn't let me see them. I never heard him complain about his responsibility uh, taking care of the family. And with both of our parents gone, uh, my, my mother five years before and then my father, I remember when we were walking back to our cars after that little uh, committal ceremony was over, looking at my brother and going, you realize we're orphans. And I never had thought of that before, the idea that both of, of my, my, my parents were gone. And you know how it is, uh, you know, matriarch and patriarch of the family, and then all of a sudden everything shifts, everything changes, uh, all, all sorts of things. And uh, that I was going to have to be the patriarch of my family now because that he had... He had moved on. Now, I have to tell you, 
as grieving as I was, I wasn't grieving like other people who had no hope because I knew something that my, that, about my father. You see, my father had given me the greatest gift any father could ever give a son, any parent could ever give a child, and that is the knowledge of where he was spending eternity. That changes everything. So I grieve, but not, not, not like people who don't have any hope. Now, he was gone from us, and he was with the Lord, but what he left us with was priceless to me because I had received so much from him, received his protection, his provision, his financial investment, his emotional investment, his spiritual investment. I mean, he, he was a key player in me becoming a Christian, so I was uh, kind of latching on to my, my mother and father's faith. I, I actually have a picture, a black and white picture that somebody, I don't know who took it, of me in the waters of baptism with uh, our pastor baptizing me, but my father got in the water when that was something that was never done. He got in the water in his Sunday suit, and he's standing there with his arms folded like, you better do this right, man. You know, like, like I mean... And you can't even see my face. You just see my feet, you know, because I'm I'm in the like the prone position. You can see my socks. And uh, back then, you were at, in our church. You were actually baptized in the clothes you wore. And uh, and so it's kind of kind of interesting that he gave me this spiritual investment, and he taught me, and he trained me, and he gave me grace, and he gave me mercy. But most of all, he gave me love. Now, by that time, I was a father. I was a father four times over, and I was doing my best to instill the things that my father had instilled in me into my children. And I'm sure that I'm not, I don't live up to those expectations, but I'm trying, and I, and I tried. And, and I was realizing something by that time in my life at 40, is that being a father is a lot more than just a biological reality. That being a father is a responsibility. And I, I, and I was thinking about that word as I was preparing to preach today. The, the word responsibility. Because there's a word inside of it. And the word inside of the word responsibility is the word response. So when this baby is presented to you, how are you going to respond to that? You know, it's more than a biological reality because the response is, this is a big responsibility. I don't know what this is going to entail, but this is a huge responsibility. And my dad's response to that responsibility was great for me, and, I, and hopefully it's continuing to live on in me. And then in my kids, I see it as they are now parents, and I'm a grandparent even though my father's been gone for 23 years from this world, I see his legacy living on. And I can tell you that even though he has been gone for 23 years, he'll always be my father. Now we've been in this book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 9. And when Isaiah is describing the coming Messiah, he uses these really colorful metaphors. Beautiful metaphors. I, I remember from when I was in choir and I was singing these uh, in Handel's Messiah because there's a song in there and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor. Hear that metaphor in there? Mighty God, Prince of Peace. But then there's this one. That stands out. You know, it talks about the government being on his shoulders, that he's bearing the weight of government. But then there's this one, one, this one metaphor that captures something much more personal than all the others. And it's the one that I'm going to talk about today, and that's everlasting father. You see, when it describes him as a wonderful counselor, I, I see him as somebody I can go and talk to and pray to, and I, I know he hears me. And I know that he responds to me. When I think Prince of Peace, I think of all of the clamor and turmoil in my life and how he can bring peace into my life because of what he has done for me when he died for me on the cross and was buried and rose from the dead. 
When I think of mighty God, I, I think about all of his power, power that could actually raise him from the dead, the power that could create the world and the universe, all this power. But when I hear everlasting Father, now that's different because that's personal. That's relational. That's talking about his relationship to me. And the things that I know now as a father and as a grandfather and the things that I witnessed with my father, I can ascribe some of that to him. And that is that he loves me no matter what. That he gives me all these things even though I don't deserve them and I, I didn't really have them coming to me. It's a special term, everlasting father. Now, the night before Jesus died for our sins, he actually kind of connected with something from the book of Isaiah chapter 9. Even though those words were 700 years old when, uh, <clears throat> when we refer to them before Jesus. And he said it by using a single phrase. And, it, and this is the night, this is the night before he's crucified. Look at what he says. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I want to stop right there. I'm going to read the rest of this, but... He's not saying your heavenly Father will, leave you as, will not leave you as orphans. He's saying I will not leave you as orphans. Now the idea of orphan has to do with parenting, right? And so it's like even though Jesus is the Son and we recognize that the Father is the Father that's on His throne, Jesus is ascribing to that like He is our Father as well. Like He has this kind of a relationship to us It harkens back to Isaiah chapter 9, where the Son of God, the Messiah, is called Everlasting Father. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world won't see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. Wow, that's great. Because we know from His resurrection that that power that raised Jesus from the dead not only has the power to raise Jesus from the dead, it has the power to raise you from the dead. It has the power to raise me from the dead. And as I'm contemplating death on my 40th day, birthday, I know that it, Jesus has the power to raise my father from death. On that day, you will realize that I'm in my father, you're in me, and I'm in you. Listen to that relationship that's in there, the depth of this relationship. So he's taking on the role of father to his disciples, but not just a father, everlasting father. You see, he wasn't going to let a petty thing like death at the hands of mere mortals separate him from us. I think that's cool. In, in, in Hebrews chapter 13, it uses that term mere mortals. Look, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That's that everlasting quality. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. He didn't, he, it isn't that He was, He is right now because He exists right now. And I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? What could mere mortals do to my Savior? What could mere mortals do to my Lord? Oh, they could put Him on a cross. They could nail Him to that cross. And he would pay the ultimate price and die on that cross, but they couldn't keep him there, could they? No, they couldn't. You see, what my earthly father couldn't do, because he was a mere mortal, just like I'm a mere mortal, my heavenly father, my everlasting father can do, because he is more than that. John the Baptist revealed this to his followers when he was talking about Jesus. It's recorded in John 1.30. It says, this is the one I meant. He's pointing at Jesus and he says, this is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now John the Baptist was older than Jesus and yet he says he was before me. So he's recognizing something about Jesus that's recorded also in Isaiah that he's an everlasting Father. The Hebrew writer also described Jesus' everlasting quality in Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Same Jesus 
that died for you 2,000 years ago, the same Jesus that you were introduced to when you decided to become a Christian is the same Jesus that will meet you at the gates of heaven. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm sharing this with you today because Jesus Christ being my everlasting Father is the gift I need. We're going to get all sorts of gifts, giving them, receiving them, experiencing so many things in this season, but this really is the gift you need. I was blessed to have an earthly father that was incredible for me. I'll forever be grateful that he chose my mother because that was the best decision he ever made. And you know what? He gave me a lot of great things. He gave me his name. He gave me his traits. He gave me his care, his love, and his inheritance. He gave me a family to be a part of so that I could feel chosen and special. But you have an everlasting father. And I have an everlasting father. And the fact that I'm his child is no accident. You see, I'm chosen and special. And so are you. Every single one of you. You're chosen and you're special. Because God was involved in your creation. I know the world never stops saying that we're the product of circumstance and coincidence. And that's just a complete and absolute lie. That's not true. There's nothing coincidental about you. There's nothing circumstantial about you. You were knit together in your mother's womb by an everlasting father who loves you, who knew you before you were born. Science proves this. Really? Yeah. You know, in the process of human creation, a woman provides only a single product of her DNA. But the man provides between 250 and 400 million variations of his DNA. 250 and 400 million! And only one of those got to be who you are today. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are special and chosen before you were born. You are already, at birth, you were one in half a billion. Now, some of you, and listen, I, I, I mean, I'm saying a lot of great things about my dad. And I know that some of you are not relating to what I'm saying because you had a completely different experience with your earthly father. Maybe you have some deep-seated anger. Maybe there's a lot of hurt that's in your life on account of him. But I want you to see something today, that your heavenly father was much more involved in your creation than your earthly father ever was. And before you reject the word or the concept of father, because a lot of people do. A lot of people, they hear that, and they've had those, their experiences, and they're like, I don't even like hearing that. I don't even like God being called that. Understand that the earthly fathers, they're the shadowy images of our true father, our heavenly father. I want you to consider that you're his creation. That you were designed in heaven to be his child. That you were fearfully and wonderfully made. And when you came into this world, he gave you his name. He gave you his traits. He gave you his care and his love and his inheritance. You remember what he said to us in Genesis chapter 2. Now let us make mankind in our image after our likeness and let him rule. You're made to be his child. The Bible tells us that we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We receive a portion of the inheritance that we receive from our Father. Look at the family. Look around you and look at the family that he gave us (coughs) to be a part of while we're here on earth, all the way in and past the gates of heaven. But unlike our earthly fathers, He will not leave us as orphans. He'll be our Father beyond the veil of this life and into eternity. You and I, we're the same. We're the same because when we came into this world and we were born, we were completely and absolutely vulnerable, right? 
The only thing we knew was that we needed, but we didn't even know how to communicate it without crying. And even though I didn't have any ability to do that on my own and I was completely vulnerable, my Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father, provided people for you to meet those needs in ways that at that time you or I could not comprehend because you were powerless and I was powerless. To come to Jesus is to recognize that you're powerless. It's to recognize that you can't solve these problems on your own. That you're weak and vulnerable. That all you understand is that you need. That there's something inside you that needs to be filled, but you cannot provide it for yourself, and only He can provide it for you. That's why Jesus says that the only way to come to Him is to come as a little child. Because a little child recognizes that. Sometimes we, we try to be so with it, you know, we try to be so smart and think how we're going to try to utilize my relationship with God when the thing that we must learn is that we are just powerless and weak, like little children needing to come to our everlasting Father. Because when we do that, that's when we truly begin to recognize who we really are. And the fact that He is the gift that I need the most. Some of us, during this season, we're going to be thinking about the nativity. How many of you have a nativity scene in your house? Raise your hand if you have a nativity scene, right? A reminder of what Christmas is really about. I remember growing up, we always had that nativity scene that was always front and center under the tree. Like the tree was raised up and there was that nativity scene to remind us about Mary and Joseph and the animals and the angels and the shepherds and later the wise men. We see this little newborn baby that's swaddled and lying in a manger. And we might even think, oh, look at that poor little baby, you know, in the in that barn in Bethlehem, and, and, that, and that little child is so powerless and so vulnerable. <laughs> Not really. Because you're in that picture. And I'm in that picture. You're in that nativity, and I'm in that nativity because it's us. The ones that are standing in front of it, wherever it's placed in our house, we're the ones that are really vulnerable and powerless. We're the ones that are really needy. Isn't it interesting? Sometimes we see things in the wrong way, the, in, the, in the wrong perspective. And that's the way the world is now. The world has the wrong perspective about the nativity. Even if they believe in the nativity or even if they remember this historical reality that Jesus was born, they see all the wrong things. I wonder what you see when you see the nativity in your mind's eye. Let me tell you what I see. I know what the world sees. The world sees poverty. Mary and Joseph, nothing, powerless, po nothing, and, and, and here they are in a, in a barn. But you know what I see? I see royalty. The world sees oppression, you know, at the hands of the Roman government, but I see deliverance, deliverance from sin. The world sees insignificance, but I see greatness. The world sees taxes, but I see gifts. The world sees darkness, but I see the light of the world. The world sees no room at the end, but I see an open door to every human heart. The world sees rejection, but I see an invitation. The world sees godlessness, but I see the gospel. The world hears a baby crying, but I can hear angels singing. The world hears a mother travailing, but I hear people rejoicing. The world sees just another mortal baby, but I see my everlasting Father. Because Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called. Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, 
the Prince of Peace. With all the things that are happening this Christmas season, all the things that are vying for your attention, maybe right now at this moment is the time to concentrate on what you truly need, the gift you need the most. We're moving to a time of decision. So is that happening to you? Is, that, is, that, is, it, is it crazy right now? Is, it, is everything like, is your head like exploding? Uh, Allison uh, likes for me to drive her to high V, drop her off at the front, and then either circle or find a spot so she can call and I can pick her up. And I kind of like that. Because when you walk through the grocery store, I might have five different counseling sessions and I haven't got to aisle three yet. So I'm all right with that. But not yesterday. Not yesterday. Yesterday was nuts. If you go into the hy V parking lot, your IQ goes down by at least 20. I don't know what, get, I mean, you know, it comes over people. I park in a spot. I'm getting my car hit, doors hit my car. Like, come on. It's crazy. People, you can see that they're exasperated. They're rushing. It's a crazy time, right? And it can be a crazy time for you right now for lots of different reasons. It could be you're trying to get stuff ready because you got a lot of family coming in. It could be that you're trying to get stuff ready because you're going to be piling all your kids in a car and going somewhere. It could be that you're going to be facing Christmas alone this year. And you don't have people to celebrate with. And it's heartbreaking for you. It could be a lot of different things. And I don't know what's going on in your life. I have no idea. But I know this. That in spite of all of those things, last minute shopping, dinners to prepare for, travel plans to make, loneliness to manage, a heart that may hurt for one reason or another, You have an everlasting Father. If you are in an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you have an everlasting Father. As hectic as this time is, you have an everlasting Father. As lonely as it can be, that empty place at the table that was there last year, year that was being filled by someone you love, regardless of your circumstance in the lower story, you have an everlasting Father. I've experienced a quarter century of Christmases without my dad. 30 years without my mom. And even though I don't get to have that place, and I would give a lot to have those moments with them, I know that they're saving a place at the table for me. At a table in heaven. Because I was not left as an orphan. And if you're here today and you don't have that knowledge because that flows out of an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've never made that decision, don't make, wait for somebody else to try to buy you that gift. It's already been paid for and it's available for you because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished 
and make that gift your own today because it's the gift that you need. There's going to be someone right over there by the baptistry who'd love nothing more than to talk to you about your next steps in becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. And like the Christmas carol says, when that is accomplished, you can sleep in heavenly peace. Because you have a, an everlasting Father. Many of you today have made that decision for Christ. But you are caught up in the insanity that is the season of the year. But you did something very wise today. You took time out of that crazy busy schedule to spend time with your Father in heaven. Your brothers and sisters in Christ and you're here right now. I wonder if you might squeeze just a little bit more potential out of this moment. Because it's great that you're sitting here. It's great that you're worshiping. It's great that you're listening. But I wonder if you might squeeze just a little bit more potential out of this moment. And come up here. And get down on your knees. And whatever burden you're carrying. To let him have it. Because if the government can rest on his shoulders. And I'm not talking about one government or one nation. I'm talking about all governments and all nations for all time. If he can bear the burden of all those governments on his shoulders, he can take your burden too. Not only will he take it, he asks for it. And I wonder if there's some here that just might, as you're going into this next crazy week, if you might say, I'm going to get low and I'm going to let this burden come off my shoulders and I'm going to let the Lord have it. Just be that little child knowing that you need and let Him provide for that need. Would you stand with me? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name I pray that that this congregation, when it leaves this place today, will feel their burdens lifted. That Father, your Son Jesus, He took all of that burden on Himself when He carried that cross up the hill. When He carried all of our sins, and the weight of our sins, on His shoulders. And even now, He's here to carry those burdens. And that's something that He will do for us for all eternity because He is the everlasting Father. So I pray right now that like little children we'll let you have that burden. In Jesus' name, Amen.